fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come. And I know by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to lead the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4. Beloved, God's real. And he knows what you need. He loves you before you even can love yourself. He's thinking about you more than he's thinking about you. This morning, I was driving in, didn't even realize that a burden that I might have been carrying or whatnot, and just coming in and just heavy a little bit, I guess. I'm not quite sure. And on the radio, I was sitting out in the parking lot before I came in. On the radio, song came on to leave your burden at the cross. And I said, Lord, thank you. That's exactly what I needed right there, right in that moment. I needed, I needed that song, right? Right there, I was walking down the, the hallway, coming over, I, was, I taught the uh, teen Sunday school class, and I was singing, and listen, singing, when I say I'm singing, that's a stretch of the word. <clears throat> I was humming, whatever, whatever, singing Come Down Found, and Katie was right there in the hallway, she said, why are you singing that? I said, because the Lord just had down my heart. She said, well, we're going to sing that at church this morning. Said, Thank you, Lord, I love that song. Tune my, tune my heart to sing thy praise. Love it, that ought to be our our heartbeat, and then that choir special this morning was just once again the Lord speaking to me. So I hope he's speaking to you this morning, and uh, I know he will. The Lord will speak to you this morning. How do I know that? Because we're about to read his word. And he always speaks to his word to his children. And so Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17, and uh, you make plans to be here. We're going to have a good crowd. It's going to be, Lord really answered in a powerful way last year. And we don't know what he might want to do this year. We just know we're going to be faithful and ask God to, to work on our behalf and on his behalf and see souls saved, families coming. We already got commitments. Um, but beloved, don't let the crowd deter you. I know sometimes well, it's going to be chaos and we're going to be outside. No, it's going to be fun. It's going to be great. It's a big day. And uh, you make plans to be here. Bring somebody with you. Uh, what a great opportunity. Promise to buy them lunch. And then when you show up, you're like, oh, we're having lunch. Here's your, here's your lunch. And it's all taken care of. Brother Todd is going to roast us a fine pig uh, uh, next week, uh, Friday night or uh, Saturday night. If you're wanting to, be, we're going to try to go all night too. We've like microwaved a pig in the past. I mean, like literally nuclear it in four hours. This year, we're going to try to go low and slow. I was looking for you. I, why, I knew you were right here. Uh, we're going to go low. So we're going to be for all night. And I usually bring my camper, and I sit here and pray all night, and they're going to be up here trying to play pranks on me all night. And uh, so if you want to come by, just stop by the church, stop by, we'll be here. And uh, you come by, and we'll, we usually eat well all throughout the night as well. And so you come and just pray with us. If you want to come up Saturday night and say, you know, I'm going to stop by the church, just pray with the guys. You come, and we'll be having prayer meeting all night, which also includes a little bit of food and other things as well. And so looking forward to a great week next week. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. Ephesians 4, 17, the Bible says this, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness and greedy, with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. I'm going to read that again. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Jesus is the truth. Verse 22, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Here in chapter 4, Paul has been preaching to us about our walk. The title of our message this morning is A Different Walk. A different walk. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, help us this morning as we open your word. Lord, already you have spoken to us and you have brought us to the point that we have to be concerned with our walk. Lord, I pray that this morning that you would give us a fair analysis. Your spirit would search us and you would try our hearts, O Lord, and create in us a clean heart. Lord, we're asking you that we would have a walk that is worthy of you and that is separate from the world. But help us now. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I like how Paul begins this next thought in verse 17. This I say. In other words, he's saying, now it is time for truth to affect your life. We've been talking about the truth of God's spirit and all the great things of salvation. And in these first three chapters, Paul has been telling us about these high and glorious things of God. But now he has brought us to where the rubber meets the road. And he says, if God is true and Jesus died on the cross for your sins and he is the son of God and he rose again and you have the Holy Spirit inside of you and you have an inspired word. Now we must apply this truth and it must begin to affect your walk. But what a shame that you would come week after week and hear Bible preaching and your walk never be changed and your walk never be challenged and you never be pointed in a different direction. And because of your relationship with a New Testament body of believers and because your relationship with Emmanuel Baptist Church, that your life would just go on the same way it has always gone on and not be changed by the preaching of God's word. What a waste and what a shame. Paul says this, this I say. And notice what he says, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. Now, for the church at Ephesus, this was a problem. This is a problem. Beloved, this is the problem in churches today. This is the problem of the hour today. The problem of the hour is that there are Christians who have the new man that are walking like the old man. The problem that you are struggling with today is that you are trying to walk as other Gentiles walk. The problem is believers is that they attempt to live contrary to their new birth and live like unbelievers. Let me tell you this. If you were to do a fair analysis of your life right now, the points of frustration in your life are the points where you are trying to mix the new life with the old life. Because Christ is not frustrating. God does not frustrate us. He is not the author of confusion. You're at what God, and when we obey him and follow his word, he gives us joy unspeakable and full of glory. But rather, the consternation comes in your life and in the believer's life when we try, when we find the intersections in our life where we are trying to grasp hold of the new life and yet still hold on to the old life. And Paul says this, you can't walk like other Gentiles anymore. And some of you that are new Christians have come to find out you can't have it both ways. You either got to live, live for God or live for the world. You either got to serve Jesus or serve yourself. But beloved, no man can serve two masters. And Paul is saying here, 
that just as at the church of Ephesus, so is today. The problem represented in this auditorium this morning are there are, that there are people that are refusing to walk the different walk. They're refusing to walk after holiness, after righteousness, the Christ-like life. Beloved, three ways you as a believer in Jesus must walk different than the lost. Now listen, if you're saved, we ought to be different. Don't you believe that? I mean, a saved person ought to be drastically different than a lost person. And yet, in today's weakened and watered down evangelicalism and Christianity in America in the 21st century, there is little difference between the church house and the bar house. There's little difference between what goes on in the church house and the movie house. There's little difference of what goes on inside the church and what goes on outside the church. And the Bible says it should not be so. You ought to be different. You ought to walk in a different walk. You ought to walk in a different way and not desire to walk as other Gentiles walk. But rather, you ought to be distinct in what you are doing. First of all, three ways. You as a believer in Jesus. And that's the qualification here. You have to have believed Jesus unto salvation. Must walk different than the lost. First of all, they are blind, but you can see. Number one, they are blind, but you can see. That is one of the great differences between a saved person and a lost person. Look what the Bible says here in verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the what? blindness of their heart. You see, a lost person walks with their eyes wide open, and yet they are unable to see what is completely obvious. The world is confused today. Commentator John Phillips said it this way, man's thinking, alienated from God, is vanity. He thinks up all kinds of false religions and philosophies, and boasts of how right he is, yet his notions are empty and dangerous. They are the walking blind. They are walking with their eyes wide open, but they cannot see anything. Man, can come, man, the Bible says here, can only come up with vanity of the mind and darkness of understanding. It is from this that his birth many spurious thoughts. Uh, uh, for instance, as the, the Christian scientists that believe that death is not real and that pain is an error of the mortal mind. The, the, the Mormon that believes that they can become God. The Hindu that believes they might come back as a cow or a cockroach or a, a bird. The, the scientific community that believes that we evolved and that you came from an ape. The humanist that thinks that they are essentially good and they can cope with all a man's problems. And the religionist who masks the stench of his own corruption with the temporary perfect of his own good works, God hates that stench. See, the world is blind. A lost person is blind. The Bible says that they are alienated from God. And this alienation from God, this alienation from God causes them to have an, aver an aversion to God. That's the difference between a lost person and a saved person. See, a lost person in the darkness and the blindness of their hearts and minds has, has an aversion. The idea of God repulses them. Well, at least the God of the Bible, not the God of their own making, the God of their own idols. But it always amazes me. And listen, um, we have no greater proof of this than what we did yesterday. Once again, we had our last maximum outreach. We went and handed out newspapers. And I'm amazed because every single week, Meyer sends you four. And the independent fills up your mailbox. And I'm amazed of all the literature that people get. There are, the, the, by the response that we get to our literature sometimes, there ought to be mass societal rioting going on because of all the junk mail goes on if they complain as much about that stuff as they complain about our stuff. But inevitably, we go out and we hand out a paper that says Emmanuel Live on it. It has gospel truth in it. It has biblical thought attached to it. It has a gospel track in the middle. It has an invitation that a person might come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the heathen look at that and are averse to it. 
And I'm amazed how they are so adverse sometimes, they can't just throw it in the trash can. And beloved, some of you that are watching by our live stream in our community, you got a newspaper and you're thinking, if you don't want to read it, you can return it, but you can't just throw it in the, news t- the trash can. But they are such haters of God. they got to literally got to call up and make their voice known. I had a gentleman this week come right back to the church, deliver two right back to us. Oh, thank you. Two more to hand out. <laughs> Should have thrown them in a trash can. But there's an aversion... To God. They don't want to know about God. Had a lady tell me yesterday that we weren't allowed to distribute literature in their community. I said, says who? Well, she did for police. I said, call him. What do you mean we don't have permission? We can, this is America. This is not North Korea. We, we, could, we could go around and we could distribute gospel literature. You could, I could tell you whatever I want to tell you and you could do with it whatever you want. That's your American right. But understand this, the heathen, the lost person, has a complete aversion to God. The Bible says they are alienated from him. You see, Christ and his cross is the point of reference that a man is to live his life by. And without this, man cannot know where he is, who he is, and where he is going. you got to have your point of reference. And it is Christ and his cross. Remember in the old days when you were reading a map before Google and you could just ask your phone to tell you everywhere you're going? And you pulled out the map and as you were trying to make heads and tails on the map, the first thing they put up in the side is they put a compass and said, well, this is north. And the first thing you start looking around is for some landmarks. i got to orient myself so I can figure out where in the world I am on this map. And beloved, in the believer's life, the orientation of your life ought to be Jesus Christ and his cross as communicated to us by God's word. That is the the north star. That is the pivot point. That is the the structure. That is the monument. uh, That is the, 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 the landscape. That is the flagpole. Whatever you want to picture it as, that is the point of reference that the rest of your life orients around. And to a lost person who has rejected Christ, They have no point of reference. That's why they can come up with every vain philosophy and every new religion and every spurious thought, holding that up as the truth when it is there is no truth in it because it contains no Christ. See, the the number one way that you are different than a lost person, that they are blind with their eyes wide open, but beloved, the Bible says that you are to walk by faith and not by sight. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Beloved, this is not a blind faith. Understand this. There are no blind faith sheep lemmings around here. It's not a blind faith. Some people accuse us, well, your religion is just a crutch. No, no, our religion is a cross. And Jesus died on it and was buried and rose again. And he is coming again. Our religion is a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. See, you walk by faith and not by sight. You're not blind, but rather, it's not a blind faith or a blind sight, but rather a walk that is illuminated by the scriptures and received by faith. See, we're not walking blind. We're walking with the flashlight of the Bible. The psalmist said it this way, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. See, it's not a blind faith. It's an illuminated faith. It's not grasping in the straw, in the, in, the, in, the, in the darkness, grasping for something to hold on to. But rather, it's by using the word of God and shining it before us. And it shows us which way we are going. See, the, main, the number one difference between a lost person and a saved person, or the number one difference in your walk, is that you ought to walk by the sight given by the Word of God. See, the problem is, Christians who refuse to look where they are going because they are not looking in the book. See, when you are, do not have a daily relationship with God's Word, you are walking like a lost person. 
Or you might have the indwelt spirit inside of you that is holding on to the fragments of scripture that you have fed it in your, in your sparse diet of Sunday morning to Sunday morning. But that's not how God intended you to walk. God intended you to walk fully illuminated by his word, making your path and your direction very clear. And yet there are many Christians today that are simply walking blind because they refuse to get in the book. Beloved, we ought to look at the world events and go, we know exactly what's going on. I, I know exactly what is happening. I'm excited here in September. We're going to have our prophecy series again. And Pastor Levesque is going to be preaching on Sunday nights all through the month of September. And you know how we can preach about prophecy? You know how we can preach about things that come? Because the book shows us exactly what's happening. It is not darkened to us. It's enlightened to us. And beloved, there are no dark areas in your life that the word of God cannot shed some light on. Christians ought not be constantly confused or bemuddled. Christians should ought not constantly be groping in the dark for the next uh, spiritual lollipop that they can grab a hold on, the next Hallmark card that makes them feel good, the next Facebook meme that kind of enlightens their day. What they ought to be doing is all, holding on to the firm foundation of God's word, illuminating them down life's path. You do not have to walk blind as a lost person does. Now, let me say something here about the flock, the flock that is before us. The problem for many Christians is they refuse to look, in, look where they're going by looking in the book. But the problem is, in our midst, there are lost people. And let me rephrase that. In this room. There are lost people who get in amongst the flock and confuse walking with the crowd as walking with God. Understand what I'm saying here. So there are people, and quite possibly in a crowd this size, there is someone here who has never trusted Christ as their Savior, has simply found themselves blind, because the Bible says they're blind, but they got themselves around a group of people, and so they're kind of holding on with those people, and they're walking with them, but they're not walking with God, they're just walking with a crowd. And beloved, the Bible says that there comes a reckoning day, and that Jesus separates the wheat from the tear, and you will not get into heaven on anyone's coat strings here. It just won't happen. You have to walk by your own, by faith, your personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the Bible says a person, the difference between a lost person and a saved person is a saved person can walk by sight. They walk by faith. And this faith is what gives them sight from the word of God. They are blind, you can see. Secondly, they satisfy the flesh, but you mortify the flesh. Give you a vision for yourself here. Paul says these other Gentiles, they, they live to satisfy the flesh. But beloved, you ought to mortify the flesh. Verse 19, who being past feelings have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Greediness. See, a lost person can't help but satisfy the flesh. That is their driving passion. Even their good works are an attempt to satisfy the flesh. Notice the word that is used here, or the phrase, who being past feeling. The, the Greek word underlined here is only used in this one time in the, in the New Testament. And it has the idea of a person who no longer has any shame. No shame. But we ought to be convinced of the disparity between a lost person and a saved person by the fact of our culture today that shows no shame. No shame. We live in a culture that possesses no shame of its actions. The most perverted and wicked things can be displayed on our streets and in our televisions and the world never bats an eye at it all they say is give me more vileness go to the next level that go to greater depravity show greater wickedness blaspheme god even louder paul says these gentiles or these that are outside the faith walk with no shame Beloved, the Christian that is walking in the world, or we ought to, as we live in the world, but are not of the world, 
and by our daily course of actions, if you walk in the world and never blush, never turn your eye, never have a grieved spirit, then shame on you. Then shame on you. Because, beloved, this world is so vile, and there is no shame in them that it ought to cause a Christian, as they walk in it, to constantly be demanding to walk in the Spirit, to turn their eye away from certain things, that there are some things that ought to make some Christians blush. And the problem is that even in the church house, there's some things that you, we are allowed to, we tolerate in our lives that we ought to show great shame over, but we show no shame over. And when we do that, we are walking as a lost person. See, a lost person has no shame. <clears throat> Notice what he says here. Uncleanness with greediness. Bible talks here. Not only do they have no shame, but in their sensuality and, de- and depravity... Paul describes for us the insatiable character of sensual sin. It's never satisfied. It always wants more. And beloved, when you walk in the flesh, your flesh will always demand more. When you play with sin, sin will always want more. This is why even on the basic basic sense, we have to reject sensuality in our worship because our flesh will want it more and more and more. See, they can't help but to satisfy the flesh, but the Bible says that you must mortify the flesh. You must mortify your flesh. Paul said in the book of Romans, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, for we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. We do not, believers, do not walk according to our carnal passions, but rather by spirit persuasion. That is how you ought to walk. And yet for so many believers, they find themselves motivated by carnal passion as opposed to spiritual persuasion or the Spirit's persuasion. Notice this. Let me preface this for a moment. The Bible says, Jesus says, that the church, the gates of hell, shall not prevail against it. In other words, the Lord's church is a powerful entity. It's a powerful organization. It is empowered by the Spirit of God and purchased by the blood of Christ. There has never been a force, an organization, an entity, an organism on the planet more powerful than the Lord's church because it's powered by His Spirit. I'm I'm telling you, beloved, the church is powerful. I mean, it can literally change nations. I was telling the young people this morning about a prayer meeting that started in Europe in the Moravian prayer movement that, that for a hundred years it was a prayer movement that went on. And it started with this little old church uh, out in, 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 in the Alps or in, in, in Europe. And they were a persecuted people. And they went there and these Moravians started praying. And out of that small group, over the, over the first 25 years, 300 missionaries were sent all over the world. And this little group had the power and spirit of God in them, this little church up in the mountains, and they literally birthed the modern missions movement out of one prayer meeting that lasted 100 years. You know why? Because they had the power of God. And beloved, understand this. In thinking about this point, about about a carnal person or a lost person satisfies the flesh, but a Christian, a believer, ought to mortify the flesh. The weakness of the church today is not God, but carnal Christians. Think about that. If we are to be what God says we are, it is not his deficiency. And for us to accuse God that he has withheld something for us is blasphemous. But if we do not have the power of God in our midst, it's not because God has left us wanting. It's because we have abandoned him and have lived after our lives in carnality. 
Remove carnality from the church and you will see power. Mark it every time. Remove carnality from your life and you will see power. The power of God will begin to work in your life. If you have weakness, root out carnality. Root out fleshly living. Root out fleshly desires. Root out all the times where you are satisfying your flesh, motivated by your carnal passions, and be persuaded by the Spirit. The weakness of the church is carnal Christians. The weakness of the pulpit is carnal preachers. The problem is Christians living instinctually by their flesh The problem is that Christians are living instinctually by their flesh and wondering why they never have peace, joy, or satisfaction. All the things that Jesus promises. The problem for a lost person in the midst is they're trying to live right by the power of the flesh and void by the Spirit of God. Lastly, the difference between a lost person and a saved person between These Gentiles that Paul said that we ought to have a different walk. Number three, they are clothed in corruption, but you are clothed in Christ. They are clothed in corruption, but you are clothed in Christ. Verse 20, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. See, they, the lost person, carries the stench of death. See, they are the old man. The old man that is dead in trespasses and sins. Paul taught us this in Ephesians chapter 2. Without Jesus Christ and without your sin being washed by the blood of the Lamb, the Bible says that you are dead in your trespasses and sins. And here, in this illustration, you are the old man. Following that old nature. A sinner by birth. Because Adam sinned and you inherited it. Notice the Bible uses the word corruption. In other words... The decay decay that comes with dying or of death. It is the lost that are the real walking dead. Corrupt according to the deceitful lust. But beloved, this is not you. You are not the walking dead. You are alive in Christ. You carry the aroma of Christ. Not the aroma of death. You have been, your garments have been made clean. You are not the old man, but you are now the new man. And in the new man, you have been given Christ's righteousness and you've been given garments that are spotless and you have been made clean. And yet it is as the dog returns to his vomit, so does the fool to his folly that clean Christians made clean by the blood of Christ determined to return back to the follies of the old man and mask themselves with the stenches of death in their life again. And the Bible says this, You have not learned this from Christ. But ye have not so learned Christ. See, you have learned Christ. The contrast between the lost and the saved should not be minuscule, but should be a Grand Canyon. Because you know Christ. There is a difference. The difference is that you have Jesus. You have Jesus. Notice this statement. Truth, apart from the person of Christ, has little power. Truth, apart from the person of Christ, has little power. The Christian walk, apart from a personal walk with Jesus, is empty and makes little sense because it has lost its context. So where does a person go wrong? They stop walking with Jesus. 
They stop abiding with Jesus. They stop praying to Jesus. They stop reading Jesus' word. They stop thinking about Jesus all their time. They, they stop singing the songs about Jesus and they start th- singing other songs and they start watching other things and they start filling their minds with other things. And all of a sudden, one day you wake up and you're doing all these Christian things, but because you've lost a personal, you've lost your abiding in Christ or you're not abiding with him, you've lost all the context of why you're doing anything. Ever gone that way about church? I mean, you're just going through the motions. I mean, you're doing church and you're going through all the right motions and you're doing all the right things, but you're doing it because that's just what everyone else has done and that's what people are expecting out of you. And you've lost the complete context of why you're here and what you're doing. And beloved, if you find yourself in that spot this morning, just going through the motions, the problem in your life is that you're not abiding with him because Jesus is the context of the Christian's life. It's all about him. The Christian walk apart from a personal walk with Jesus is empty and makes little sense because it has lost its context. Often, a Christian is asked, well, why do you guys do that? Or why don't you do this? You ever get those? Especially when you're trying to be a separated Christian. You're like, well, why don't y'all do this? And Why don't y'all do that? And I I don't get this. And and to a lost person, it makes very little sense. Beloved, understand this. An answer without Jesus has little meaning. Well, so, well, why do y'all do this? And say, well, and you don't know why? It's because you stopped walking with Jesus. But you say, no, 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 I, I, I live my life that way because I follow Jesus. Well, well why, don't you, why don't you watch those movies like, like the rest of us do? Well, I, I don't watch those movies because those movies depict a lot of things that Jesus died on the cross for. And I don't want to be, I don't want to celebrate, I don't want to glory in, in sin. I, I want to be, I want sin to be repulsive to me. So I'm not going to glory in what put Jesus on the cross. Well, well why, do you, why do you do that with your money? Why, why do you live that way with your money? And you, you tithe and, and you give to missions and you do all these different things. Well, you know, if you didn't do that, you could have a cabin up north or you could have a, a new truck or you could do something else. You go, well, I don't know. You know, the church just makes me do it. <laughs> no, one, no one makes you do anything. No, but you go, no, because Jesus gave all for me and I'm just going to be obedient to him and this is, my, this is how he's asked me to give to him. See, it's all about Jesus. And when you lose the context of Jesus in your life, the, the, the duties of Christianity begin to lose their meaning, begin to lose their understanding. I, I, I like what he says here in verse 20. He says, but ye have not so learned Christ. <laughs> Here's a question. We ask it to our young people sometime here at church. Ask yourself, where did I learn that? Where did I learn that? Who taught me that? One of the one of the good things about having a Christian school that has some rules and discipline and and a uniform is we kind of buffer out some of the world's influences sometimes. But but it, it finds its way in. There are fads and things that come about that 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 have their roots not in the church and not in the Bible, but has their roots in some form of worldliness and there's some guy out there or some girl out there that does this or wears their hair like that or wears this, and yet nothing about their life represents Christ, nothing about their life glorifies God, nothing about their life makes a Christian uh, love God more, to serve God more, to remind them more about, nothing about that. And so every once in a while in our school, something like a little fad will hit and we'll look around and we'll go, where did y'all learn that? We didn't teach you that. And I'm pretty sure your parents didn't teach you that because they're not that hip anymore. Where did you learn that? Where did you learn to cut your hair that way? Where, where did you learn to dress that way? Where did you learn that song? Where did you learn that idea? Because the Bible says, and Paul reminds the, the believers at Ephesus, because Jesus didn't teach you that. Jesus did not teach you that. 
And beloved, it's easy to point out and to pick on the young people on this, but adults are just as guilty of this as well. So you have aspirations and hopes and desires and all these things that you have to do with your life. And yet if you would stop for a moment and go, wait a second, did Jesus teach me that? Did I learn that from Christ? Or am I just following what the world has told me to do? Am I just following what, what, what America has taught me to do? Or, or, or I'm following the American dream? Or, or I'm, I'm trying to keep up with the Joneses? Or I'm, or I'm trying to whatever. But ask yourself this. In the motivations and the pursuits of your life, the things that you own, the places you go, the, the things that you do, who taught me that? Who taught me that? Paul asked the question, but you have not so learned Christ. Well, what has he taught us? Notice the last verse, and we'll be done there. Verse 24. What he has taught us to put on the new man. Now, this is not only talking of positional salvation, but practically as well. Practical sanctification. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Well, what has he taught you? I'll tell you what Jesus has taught you. He's taught you to put on righteousness. He's taught you to put on righteousness. To live your life in such a way that you're right with God. Righteous. Put on righteousness. At the end of this, Paul is going to tell us in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 about putting on the full armor of God. In other words, the Bible is saying here, what Jesus is saying, is that a Christian has to determine to walk a different walk than the world, to not walk after the world, but to walk in such a way and to walk after righteousness by putting it on. Put on righteousness. What else does he say? To put on holiness. To put on holiness. We ought to be those type of people. That's who we ought to be because we're Christ's followers. We ought to be the type of people that are righteous, that we try to live our, rights, our, our lives right before God and before man. That's how we ought to be. He's about to go into this in the rest of this chapter about not lying and not stealing. And we're going to spend a lot of time on these different areas coming up in the rest of this chapter here. But he says, listen, you ought to put on righteousness. And listen, you ought to put on holiness. Put on holiness. Man, it seems like today that there are many believers that have an aversion to live in a holy, separated life. And yet the, the New Testament, not an Old Testament command, but a New Testament command, is to be ye holy, for I am holy. Holiness is very becoming of Christ's bride. It's very becoming of it. He loves for us to be robed in it, glorious, without spot, that he might present it to himself, a glorious bride. We'll look at the end here. Verse 20, but ye have not so learned Christ if ye have so have heard him that ye have been taught by Jesus. Look down at verse 23, that's where I was going. So what's the conclusion of this? What you need this morning, what you need this morning is verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed. What I need, what you need, what we need in this place is a Holy Spirit renewal. Or renew my mind. Reset my mind. Get my mind, Lord, right back in the right place. To my heart to sing thy praise. You see, because all the things that we're talking about here and all the things that we're preaching about here, if you attempt to do it in your flesh, it makes you no better than a fleshly person. Makes you like the carnal person. Makes you like the lost person. Because the lost person can only do it in their flesh. But you have his spirit. By his spirit. And so our heart's desire this morning, as we determine to walk a different walk, is that God would renew my mind. Hey, before you would come to the altar and lay on the altar some cloak of the old man that you put on, that you've been wearing, would you first ask God, God, renew my mind? 
renew my mind by your spirit. Get me back to the place where Christ and his cross is the orientation of my life. Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord, help us. We need you and we need your spirit in our lives. Lord, we need to have a different walk. Lord, I pray you would help us with that. That we would not walk as others walk, but that we would walk as we have learned by Christ. Lord, be with us now during this time of invitation. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and turn to hymn number...